Well, okay, good evening. Let's pray, and then we will get right into our study for this evening. Let's look to the Lord. Lord, once again, we do look to you this evening as we gather together. Lord, always we do so with an earnest desire to draw near to you, uh, a prayer that you would be pleased uh, to grant us, uh, a clear understanding of of your word and how it instructs us and how it applies to our lives and that you would continue to help us to grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Pray God that you would help me to uh, speak these things simply and clearly and that we would uh, uh, fix clear from your word in our mind that we are yours and we are no longer of this world and uh, the days that we have here are in service to you as we await um, our true kingdom and our true citizenship. We just pray that the thoughts we consider this evening would be just very helpful in terms of our worldview and very practical in terms of our world engagement. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 11, God's word says this. It's quite simple and quite clear. As he writes to believers, beloved. So again, with the statement, uh, a simple introduction of beloved, you you get a sense of the tone of it. It is a gracious tone. It is a loving tone. And it's okay to be gracious and loving, as well as a little bit urgent and imploring. There There is, in its loving expression, nonetheless, a firm expectation. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. And that's the simple idea that we're going to consider this evening from the scriptures is this idea that we are sojourners and exiles. Now, clearly, that passage I read, you can immediately find a practical application of being sojourners and exiles, correct? I mean, none of this takes, uh, and the, the goal whenever we study the Scripture is to see what it plainly and clearly says. Uh, Noting for you, if you would, when we, we begin it with sort of a lexical study, how should we view ourselves in this world? This is an answer to that question, one of the answers to that question. We should view ourselves as not belonging to this world, but as belonging to God, as sojourners and exiles. Now again, most of us in the in our common speech, I don't know in daily conversation, probably me more than you because of the context in which I live, but how often you use the term sojourners or exiles. Of course, uh, if you're using the King James, you might say pilgrims, but we use that most exclusively during the Thanksgiving season, you know, with, uh, you know, strange notions in our mind. But what I've put there for you there is the amalgam of different words that are used in the different translations that communicate this concept. And so among them, you see sojourners, to which we would, we would understand the idea of uh, uh, travelers, those passing through, exiles, people who are in a place that is not really their place. Their place is elsewhere, but for now, they're here as exiles. Um, the New American Standard says aliens, of which can also bring peculiar notions to mind. Uh, but nonetheless, we still use that term, uh, resident alien, for uh, those who have come from other countries, foreigners, and you see these terms. Now, what I've given you also down below, one of the challenges you'll see if you look at these in translations is basically these two words are almost the same thing, and the meanings so overlap that it's really doubled up for emphasis. And so I've given you, for your own enjoyment, really some of the words there, um, uh, or the words in this passage, which is uh, paroikus. Now, and then the second one is uh, parapademus. 
these words in the Greek, I've given you the lexicon meanings, and you'll see how useful they are, particularly in, in the first one, uh, in the Freeburg lexicon. It, it says this and car- carries this sense as you go down further. Metaphorically, using a term that usually is for literal foreigners who aren't our people but have moved in among us, um, metaphorically, when it's used in the New Testament, it seems to, according to Freeburg's lexicon, carry this sense, a Christian whose real home is in heaven, one who lives for a while on earth. Again, again you see that, that idea carried out down in, in Thayer's lexicon where it says, speaks of we having a different citizenship and a different kingdom. Now, again, part of the challenge of this notion is we are in this world, correct? And as such, we are often, in our minds, dual citizens of some sort. We have a citizenship in our own country and in our nation. Uh, But imagine this, if you were to be one who had dual citizenship with just randomly the U.S., and China. And let's hypothetically say that those two nations went to war. Okay, you can't actually fight for both nations in that war, could you? It would be pretty subversive. So ultimately, when those two citizenships end up being at war, that's when an individual will clearly determine which one is the more important to me. Which one will I fight for? Which one will I die for? You know, and it would be uncomfortable were they living here, living it up here in America, and then all of a sudden at fighting time they change allegiances. You would expect that how and where they live to some extent would affect their allegiance. I'm hoping your mind is working up some spiritual analogies on the things that I'm saying to you, but we'll, we'll trace some of these things out. Uh, again, moving down to the second word, both of them basically can mean foreigner, stranger, uh, sojourner. Uh, in the second word, again, looking at Freeburg's lexicon, it says figuratively, of Christians as not counting this earth as their home. Okay, so a traveler, a sojourner, someone who is temporarily settled in a particular district. Now, beyond the word studies, what's always most effective when you study God's word is to compare scripture with scripture, see how the word of God uses the word and uses the idea to communicate different things. And it's interesting because when we go, back, go into the word of God, we're going to see individuals that we know well and that for the totality of their life, they were deemed to be sojourners and exiles. Now, for some of us, not coming from a nomadic, vagabond, uh, traveling background, the idea that we would be uh, pulling up our tent and, and moving every few years could be a little unnerving. Those who have moved after being in one place for any particular length of time, the, the very task of packing and moving is miserable and arduous. But if you know you're kind of going to be moving again in a few months, going to be moving again in a few years, then you probably would start to say to yourself, you know what? Going to kind of minimize during this season so that when it comes moving time, it doesn't get on me. Again, I'm, some of these thoughts I'm putting out there and some of the discussion and practical additional practical application, my expectation are these are conversations you all have in your households or with your dear uh, 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 close believing friends, conversations that we have as we work out the practicals of how this works. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 10, it says this, there was a famine in the land, 
So Abraham went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was severe in the land. So it's pretty clear the term sojourn in that context means he's going there temporarily. He's, he's not merely just traveling through and never stops and never does anything. He's gone there and, and he's going to remain there for a season. How long is he going to remain there? I might ask you. To which you would probably say, I don't know. If we were to interview Abraham at this time, Abraham, you're headed down to Egypt. How long are you going to be there? His response would likely be, I do not know. <laughs> I'm there for the duration of the famine. And then when it is good and sufficiently fruitful, then I will be coming back. There, was, there can be uncertainty to the duration of our sojourning. And without question, with regard to the life that is allotted to us in this world, I might interview you and say, how many years are you going to live? To which most of us will reply with a degree of uncertainty, right? And, and so again, uh, can we predict how the person sitting, how long the person sitting behind us will live, how long e e even our children will live. Not that any parents ever want to outlive their children, but we know that it happens, and we know that there are there are things that are out of our hands, and it's good to know that. Now, I would say, like Abraham's experience. Who then would ultimately be the one determining how long he would be sojourning in Egypt before he could return? The answer, proper answer would be, well, whoever it is that is in control of the famine. <laughs> and then the growth and the harvest, which happens to be, anyone want to hazard a guess? God. And so it's, it is a significant parallel to us as well how long you or I will be sojourning in this earth is in the hands of God, which is exactly where we would want it. Now let's go on to uh, the unnumbered pages today. Sorry about that. Page two. which now is uh, Genesis 15, 13 at the top. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there. So again, a good help, healthy emphasis in that. When you're a sojourner, the land is not yours. And there's a real sense in which us as believers kind of grasp that, that actually everything that we have isn't ours. There is a stewardship. It has been granted to us to make use of it, to uh, give thanks and praise to God. But the highest heavens, the earth, and all that is in it belong to the Lord. And so it, it is not theirs, and they will be afflicted for, for 400 years. Now, I've brought up this verse, even though it seems relatively obvious, because of the emphasis on the fact that sojourning means that's not where you lock in, that's not where you have your primary sense of ownership and belonging. And also here, though I said about Abraham... He had a great degree of uncertainty, but we knew who was controlling those factors that would be uncertain for him. I like that this passage as well, because it does bring in from the other side. Though how long Abraham would be sojourning in Egypt was unknown to him, who knew exactly how long he would be there? And when the, his descendants would, through Joseph and, and them, would end up sojourning in Egypt, who knew exactly how long they would be there? 
And of course, the answer is once again, clearly God. And so what often happens when we rightly study the scriptures is, is we're often confronted with the, with the creator, creature, sovereign, servant, and, and this great distinction between us. Once again in this, we are the passers-by, we are the pilgrims, we are the sojourners. He is the one who is working out all of those, the details that we have not control over. Also, Genesis 17, verse 8. I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Again, in this context, the land of his sojourning, God had directed him where to go in terms of north and south and east and west, what would be the parameters and what would be the boundaries of his sojourning. So what I'm, what I'm trying to get us to see in this is it's, it's not random rambling. Even the times that we think, I don't know what's going on here. We are sojourning in this world, and God is absolutely in control, working his purposes. Now, uh, uh, let me, how many more of these do I want to that you, you can read the rest? Jump down with me to Leviticus 25, because this is important. He had said, I will give to your offspring the land of your sojourning. So when you hear that, it initially comes to my ear, all right, He's just the traveler. They going to be the owners. Doesn't it sound like that? It does. But we come to Leviticus and it still paints a slightly different picture to keep things in perspective. It says this, the land, they would be given the land. It was allotted by tribe. And then you could, if you were in, in dire financial circumstances, you could sell your land. Like, if I was from the tribe of Asher, I could sell my land to someone from the tribe of Benjamin. But that land had been allotted to the tribe of Asher. So as and when the year of Jubilee came, that land came back. And actually, even before that, at any point in between, there, would be, there, there could be someone within that tribe that would be counted as a redeemer on the basis of, of, of being a relative who could purchase it right back out uh, from the other tribe so that it goes back to who it belongs to. Okay, so following with me there. So that, that's the context into what this, this is saying. When you sell the land, it shall not be sold in perpetuity. Now, our initial mind, humanly speaking, would have been because that belongs to Asher, because that belongs to Benjamin, that's why it can't be sold in perp perpetuity. But we're wrong, which is why I say logic and deduction can only take you so far. Follow the scripture rather than mere logic and deduction. Because in what we've considered so far, logic and deduction would lead us to the land belongs to that tribe, to that people, that family, that clan. But what does it say clearly in Leviticus 25, verse 23? The land shall not be sold in perpetuity, for the land is mine. Okay, so it hasn't, ultimately it's not Asher or Benjamin, it is God's. And then he goes on to say, for you are, this is all those who are going to be the tribes and the temporary owners of that land. All of you are, what does it say? Strangers and sojourners with me. It's mine. I own it. And even though in some temporal sense, it's a possession of yours. Note this. You're still just travelers. So in other words, what I'm saying is this. The practical, someone can take an extreme view of what we've been looking at so far and say, we're pilgrims and sojourners in this world. Don't ever actually buy a house. 
don't actually ever uh, uh, own a car. Everything should be a lease. Every, no, or whatever it would be. People can go to an extreme, don't have any possessions. That's not the case. The thing is this, even when you have, in some practical experiential sense, earthly possessions, know this, they're his. Okay. And know this, even as you have a responsibility, a stewardship, and, and sometimes owning something is way better stewardship at times than just endlessly leasing with no equity and so on. Uh, but we do what we can do. But nonetheless, in that, even if I have some degree of temporal ownership, how, might, how ought I still think of myself? How ought they still think of themselves? Even though they would not, once they inherit the land, they would not necessarily be moving. And some of them would live in the land of their allotment all the days of their life and die in the land of their allotment. They were still to consider themselves sojourners and strangers. Okay? Carry on down just a little bit with me and let's see uh, Psalm 39. Psalm 39 says this, Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear to my cry. Hold not your peace at my tears, for I am a sojourner with you, a guest like all my fathers. And we say, wait a second. This is David, likely, King David. Uh, how is he a sojourner? How are all, all their fathers a sojourner? If you're talking merely according to the flesh, not all of his fathers were earthly sojourners. But he's taking it to a different level in terms of, of a worldview, in terms of an outlook that prevails in our hearts and mind, that, that keeps us becoming, from becoming unduly attached to the things and even places of this world. Let's go a little further in this context. He says, I am a sojourner. And in Psalm 39, it's important. I think we can see something of it that our sojourning is but a short season. No matter, no matter how long we may think the journey is. It's not that long. In Psalm 39, which, from which we just read verse 12, it says this earlier in that chapter. O Lord, make me know my end, and what is the measure of my days? Let me know how fleeting I am. If God reveals to us how fleeting we are, how short this life span really is, that is so helpful, isn't it, in terms of being able to not be overly attached to the things, the places, and to some degree even the peoples of this world. We remember Jesus at times would even tell his disciples, look, some of you must love me or more than your mother and your father, your wives, your children, yea, even your own lives. And some of them would leave houses and land and mothers and fathers in order to be his disciples. And that's not always easy. Not always, in our own estimation, optimal. But when you understand, hey, it's just for a few days. It's just for a little while. Then it's bearable, right? Because again, behold, you have made my days a few hand breaths. Again, with, with this specific reference, there were a number of different ways of measuring things in the days of the scripture. You, would, you could measure things with a cubit, which is about 18 inches. But, but one of the basic, simple, small methods of measurement was a handbreadth. So that spoke of a small measure of a, a small measurement. It would be less than a cubit. And here it, it says, "You have made my days a few handbreadths." It's not very many. It's not very far. And my lifetime 
is as nothing before you. Surely all mankind stands as a mere breath. Now, I don't, I'm not a medical professional, and I don't know the official statistics on how long it takes to exhale or, or inhale or maybe a combination of the two, but I'm pretty sure it doesn't take longer than a few seconds. Yes? And so, again, this is with a sense of eternity. And so when you're really under, starting to grasp this idea of a pilgrim and a sojourner as a worldview that, we, that we, we, don't, we don't cling to those things that are passing away because to some degree we ourselves are only temporarily here and passing through. And even when it seems like it's be, becoming prolonged or protracted, it's not. It's just a few days. Not, not so much. And it goes on to say, surely man goes about as a shadow. Uh, I like that image because, I mean, I'm pretty sure we're all familiar with shadows, right? And, and, and how that generally works. Let's say if the sunset is going down behind you, you stand, stand there and the, you, it casts a shadow. And normally your shadow is significantly shorter than you. And then as the sun goes farther down, what happens? And, and the, the, the interesting thing when you, when you think of it, it, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and then what happens? And he's gone. And so so can you, we can't be a people who get so caught up in thinking, well, I'm going to be big. I'm going to be uh, a huge. I'm going to be significant. I'm going to have this impact. Uh, it, when you read Ecclesiastes, you can see so much of what, what Solomon says there. And he understands this way, that way, labor, wisdom, and all kinds of things. He keeps coming up with, with a repeated conclusion to all of the ordinary human endeavors. And what is it? All is vanity and chasing after the wind. But then he ends Ecclesiastes saying, the end of the matter is this, fear God and obey his commandments. Okay, see, there you go. Everything else really doesn't matter. You, you, you build it all up only to give it to your children, or maybe not, because they may, there may be a coup, and they're not the kings anymore, and somebody else it, takes it for themselves. You have no, a man has no idea what will come after him. That's, if you read through Ecclesiastes, it continues to state those things. And here the scriptures, in this context of building to, I am a sojourner and a guest, it is in this sense that, you know what? Yeah. I mean, realistically, I, uh, you, you might think of this. If you're going on uh, vacation to some place for a month, you might like the accommodations to be nice. Now, if you reach that destination and suddenly there was a problem with the booking and your room is not in your name and there is no vacancy, if they say, look, there's this small rundown place next door that we'll put you in for two nights until a room becomes available, you might be thinking to yourself, well, it's just, it's just two nights and then the rest of the month we're in this nice resort with all the things. We, we can do it for two nights. But what if they said, well, we're going to put you in there for the whole vacation. Well, listen, in light of eternity, how long is this life? Two nights is an overestimation. Because it's but a breath. You know, I, I often want to tell people and, and remind us of this. Sometimes we face circumstances that are almost debilitating and crushing, and they, and they bring us to, like, to cry out like the psalmist, How long, O oh Lord? How long, O oh Lord? L listen, this is the answer. 
Not long. Not long. Because nothing is long. And it'll pass. And when it passes and you're in its, his presence and you look back, that season is not going to be one that you're like, oh, it was interminable. It says this in James 4, um, verse 14 and 15. Um, you do not know what tomorrow brings. For those who are making plans to go, to travel, to profit. And again, he doesn't scold the making of plans. He scolds the presumptuous making of plans as if the outcome is within our power. Instead of a plan that recognizes its dependence on God's will for success, accomplishment, outcome. But here, in the context of that, it reminds them of a strong statement here. You do not know what tomorrow brings. You're talking about what's going to happen a year from now when you return. <laughs> You're planning what's going to happen when you return a year from now, having made a profit. You don't know what happens tomorrow. You know, you don't know if even in packing for the journey, you meet your end. Y you don't. And he's not even done. He goes on to expand on that and says, what is your life? Now, this is now taking from the Old Testament to the New Testament so that we again see the beautiful harmony and consistency of God's word. For you are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Now, this word is a word that can refer to a mist that we sometimes rise up in the morning and there will be a mist there and it does not last the duration of the day. This is also a common word that would be used to refer to steam. Now, I don't know if, I don't know if anyone here has ever gone to the extent to boil water, but if you have, you've seen steam rising from it, correct? How long does it last? Does the steam even last to the ceiling. In my experience, not. I guess potentially it could. But it, it's just here and gone. Again, your mind should be, go back to hand breaths, a mist, a vapor, a shadow. It just is so short and fleeting. A little time, then it vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. Uh, that part, when, I've, uh, uh, when I often hear this passage spoke on and taught on, um, there's much truth that's unpacked from this. The outcomes, the success, the, the, the result of the venture is ultimately in God's hands and not under your own control. But this passage goes beyond even just the beginning and the end element. It says, what is your life if God wills, you will live and then do this or that. So not only are the outcomes and success or, or lack thereof in God's control, but my life and your life, how, how long we live, is in God's control. It's good to know. Again, Paul, we've looked at this verse recently. He says, I don't account my life of any value or precious to myself if only I may finish my course in the ministry I receive from the Lord. His thought is, is, carries this sense. I am a temporary resident here. I do not know how long I am going to be stationed in this place. And while I'm here... It's not going to be, you know, in, in my mind, it's, it's I, I think of the ambassador who was stationed to Mauritius. Mauritius, for those of you who don't know, is an island in the Indian Ocean. The exterior part of the island of Mauritius is absolute picture postcard paradise. Yeah, it is such that, that the claim there is that uh, Mark Twain, when he visited there, said that God made Mauritius first and was so pleased with it, he fashioned heaven after it, which is clearly false, okay? Mark Twain is not a theologian, but the point is, 
it, 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 it's, it's a beautiful place. Yet, we were there during 9-11. And I will tell you this, the person whose, whose responsibility it was to represent the United States there, there were a lot of meetings going on. We, as all the American citizens, were called for a meeting at the residence, uh, and, and, and it was explained, this is, the, this is the position, these are the concerns, these are the cares, and uh, they were in meetings every day. They, in that place, in that time, under those circumstances, had a stewardship and a responsibility to carry out and to communicate what needed to be conveyed. You know what wouldn't have made sense? They're out at the beach sunbathing. You know, they're snorkeling. Now, I'm not saying there's no place for recreation, there's no place for rest. Don't, don't carry it to an imbalanced extreme. That's not what I'm saying. But I will tell you this. If the ambassador there was not fulfilling the expected responsibilities that were entrusted to that ambassador because they were oft doing other things for self-indulgence and enjoyment. How long should they be permitted to continue as ambassadors? I would think it would be a good idea to pull the plug on that person. Now, I'm not saying this by way of a threat, but I do think it is interesting when we look at the scriptures that uh, for some of those who were uh, dishonoring God and acting selfishly with uh, eating their food and leaving nothing for the poor, we do have in things stated to us in God's word where some of those who professed his name, gathered with his people, but lived for self and self-indulgence, at times God was pleased to also pull the plug on them. Many were becoming sick and falling asleep. And sometimes I think because of the patience of God, that he's slow to anger, merciful, compassionate, that we have a tendency to think, ah, it's okay. You know? And again, we don't, ha we don't have to, to, to have this agitation and think that he's just looking for one misstep. No, but it should be in our hearts. I don't know how many days. He's allotted to me. Sometimes I think among believers, one of the things that we might ask ourselves, or, or, or even professing believers for sure, one of the things we might ask ourselves to test our hearts would be the, the, the simple question, if you knew with certainty that God was coming back a week from today, what would you do this week? And, and if, if the answer is, well, you know, I've never been to Hawaii, and uh, I can put it on the credit card, I won't have to pay it, uh, I'm going, or, or, or if, if, all, if those are the things that start to pop up in our mind, it's like, what? But maybe it begins to stir up, you know what, I, I haven't shared the gospel with, with my cousin in about 10 years because he wasn't receptive then and I just kind of gave up. I'm going to go and talk to them again. You know what? I've been holding a grudge against this person and is, is it really going to matter next week? It's a matter of ego. a matter, And you know what? Sometimes it's a matter of they were wrong and I was right. But they'll figure that out next week. <laughs> or whatever. But things become different, Right? And so the question is, what would you do? Would you spend time in, in, in earnest prayer, in earnest service, in earnest activity, or would you engage in, in worldly endeavors? Where does your heart and mind go when I say there's a week left? What, what's the short list of the things that you would want to accomplish with but a week left? And then I ask you this. Do you know that you've got more than a week left? Do I know that? So, so we don't know. So why are we postponing some of these things that we know God would have us do? Some of these things that are God-honoring. 
some of these things that are eternally significant? Why are we withholding forgiveness? Why are we retaining hostility and animosity? Why are we, uh, why are we shrinking back from declaring the gospel? Well, you know, they always called me preachy this, or, and, and, I, and it was a little bothersome. Well, is it really that big of a deal? And so, so sometimes I think how easy it would be to not overesteem the things of this world. You know, I, like, for example, if I knew he was coming back this next week, I would not be mowing my lawn this week. But I'm not sure, so I sadly will be. Uh, but but the, the, the sense is, it puts things in, in, a, in a priority and a perspective. Where would your, where would your heart and mind lead you? Uh, again, Psalm 90, um, you, that's speaking to God, you return man to the dust and say, return, O children of man. For a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it passed. A thousand years but as yesterday. And even yesterday's not to be taken specifically to where you figure, okay, 24 hours, there's this many hours in a thousand years, percentage-wise, this is what... No, 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 no. You're, you're missing the, the poetic point of it because it's not just as yesterday. It also goes on to say, or as a watch in the night. Now, that's just, just a briefer part of the night. A thousand years are as a watch in the night. I mean, it just goes by, insignificant, just a few hours, and that's done. Can you endure anything for a few hours? Can you endure hunger for a few hours? Can you endure beatings for a few hours? What can you do? It, you know, when, you, when we think of that, can you endure loneliness for a few, a few hours? I mean, it's peculiar, like I said, I think uh, this last week, it's peculiar, um, the, the uniquely um, affluent suffering that takes place in our modern world. Oh, I haven't seen my friends in, oh, yeah, some people haven't seen food, and, and, you, and you probably have seen your friends on, on FaceTime or in some way like that, and Oh, I'm isolated. And we, we have all these complaints uh, uh, for what ultimately are pretty insignificant things. And some of the things, now, now, and it really shocks me, we're living in an age where some of the, some of the times that people are saying, because of the isolation, and at times they're isolated at home with family. So, I mean, that's, why not enjoy that? You're not alone when you're with the family. Uh, but now they're saying, because of this, how many people are going to take their lives? What? Why, why are they taking their life? Because, you know, I, I, I don't understand all the secret inner workings of individuals. And, and that they would rather not suffer those things than to, to give up their life. And then I think from the other side, but we have life etern eternal. What would we not suffer? For the few days given to us on such a time. All right, time is running, so I've got to run. Come on down with me to uh, point two. So, how should we view ourselves in this world? Short time. Pilgrims, sojourners. I'm not going to say transients, hobos, but we should nonetheless see ourselves as uh, those who this is not our ultimate destination this is not our ultimate possession we have a higher prize than this so how should we live a few thoughts come out and, and i'll just uh, uh, unpack these a little bit and then like i said leave these for your own further discussion in your homes and psalm 119 verse 19 and 20 he says this uh, i am a sojourner on the earth Hide not your commandments from me. My soul is consumed with longing for your rules at all times. This is one of the things that I, I'm tempted to ask brothers and sisters in Christ around the world these days. Now that you've got more time, potentially more freedom, 
all the, I don't have time to really, really, really pray, and I don't have time to really read and study God's Word. So now that you do, are you? I, 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 I hope so, but it, it, in the process, we may be learning something like, okay, maybe the problem wasn't a lack of time. Maybe that was an excuse And I got something to prayerfully work on right now for God to increase my hunger, for God to open my eyes to behold wondrous things out of his law, for God to stir up within me a greater desire because I've realized what my claimed excuse was, was a fraud. (laughs) And I want to be the guy who desires his word more. I want to be the, the, the woman who's earnest in prayer. You know, I, I want to be that person. And so... Now that the excuses has been stripped away, I've realized I'm not that person. Steps ought to be taken. Uh, Love Psalm 119, verse 54 as well. Your statutes have been my song in the house of my sojourning. There is just a passion for God's word. How should we live as exiles? A passion for God's word. How about that? All that we will see in the, in the next few points that I make will ultimately flow out of that. A passion for God's word is what's going to expose you to the fact that the scripture set forth Christ as our priority. It's going to expose you to the fact that we are, we're, we're to have a peculiar obedience to Christ. It's going to expose you to the fact that we're to have a patterned walk that accords with the cross of Christ. How do you learn any of those things? It comes from a passion for the word of God. So it starts there and then it builds. Hebrews chapter 11 says this, um, and now we're moving from Old Testament to New Testament. It says, these all, the Old Testament saints, died in faith, not having received the promise, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. They all acknowledged that. It is indeed due time. We acknowledge that too. For people who speak thus make it clear they're not seeking a homeland. If they'd been thinking of that land, they could have gone back, had the opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country. Note this, a heavenly one. So so this better country isn't just that the land we had, there's better out there. It's not that there's better out there. It's that there's, there's better up there. It's it's not that they're simply seeking a better temporal place, but they're saying the best that this has is not what I most long for. Further, in in this context, as we we, uh, place it out, we see that God is preparing a city for them, and we see this priority of Christ and eternal reward over now, things, comfort, pleasure, even life. Look what it says uh, um, as an example of this Moses is spoken of in Hebrews 11. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of fleeting sin. That's pretty interesting, right? They're putting Moses at this point where he has a choice. You can... Enjoy Pharaoh's palace and all those things, or you can identify with God's people and be mistreated. So what do you want, Moses? All the comforts and ease and benefits or mistreatment as one of God's people. And what did Moses choose? Well, we know this. He chose mistreatment rather than, and I love what it says in verse 26. He considered the reproach of Christ. And some some people say, wait a second. What do you mean the reproach of Christ? Jesus didn't even come in the flesh until years and years and years after Moses. Yeah, that's right. He didn't come in the flesh. But did Christ not pre-exist? Was Christ not the eternal Son of God always? Yes. Was Christ not even the rock that followed them in the wilderness? 
And the scriptures tell us of this. Listen, people who tragically try to have an origin point for Christ have confused that is the incarnation. There is no origin of the Son of God. He is eternal. And he had been purposed as the unique, the exalted, the appointed and anointed one who would fulfill God's purposes within creation of our redemption. But listen, he considered the reproaches of Christ greater wealth. Now, this is interesting and strange language. The reproaches of Christ, people mocking him, maligning him, mistreating him, Because he chose to identify with God. He considers that bad experience wealth. What? Remember, you're probably acquainted with the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are you when they mock you and revile you and utter all kinds of evil against you in my name. For great is your reward in heaven. Are you, are, you, are you ever astounded when we study things like this to just see how the scriptures fit together consistently? Old and New Testament, uh, uh, Christ and Paul and Peter, and just this glorious harmony that constantly pervades the Word of God. Because you know, there's weirdos throughout the centuries who have tried to come up and say, no, 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 only red letters, you know, or have come up and said, no, uh, w- Paul, not Peter. And even tried to pretend that there's a difference between the the writings of John. John's view of grace was this, but Paul's view, what do you mean? There's No, 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 no. John may have emphasized this element in this context, and Paul was used to emphasize this aspect in this context, but they're not at odds. I love that sound. Okay. Then it goes on to say this, uh, greater than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward, which meant he wasn't even expecting he's going to get it. And actually with him, he was leading them out, leading them through the wilderness, leading them to the promised land. Yes. Did he enter it? What did he do? From Mount Pisgah, he looked, he saw it, and he died. That was it. He never entered it. And sometimes I, I, I want us to remember this. Let, let's not be those who think, look, let me, just, uh, let me go through a, a, um, a hard couple of years. Let me endure for a couple years. Because if I just show myself faithful uh, uh, for four years, then God will fix everything. And then God will bless me for my endurance and bless me for my faithfulness. Is it, are you sure of that? It, it may be. I, I cannot say what God's plan is. There are, uh, there are interesting ebbs and flows and seasons that he has purposed in all of our life that sometimes are shocking and surprising. Sometimes I meet saints that, that seem to have been in a season of extended peace and ease. And I'm thinking, what? And then others who find very little of that. He goes on to say, um, he left Egypt not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. That's the same thing. We endure looking to Jesus, seeing him who is invisible. We walk by faith, not by sight. Also, a peculiar obedience to Christ. We are elect exiles, as it says in 1 Peter 1. And in the process of God purposing us unto himself in election, it says, and this is going to be accomplished by the the, uh, foreknowledge of God. That That is his love that he set upon us beforehand in his own grace. In the sanctification of the Spirit, where the Spirit comes and separates us out from the world unto God in Christ. Then it says also this, what? For obedience to Jesus Christ. So, obedience does not earn election, right? Obedience does not contribute to our acceptance or salvation. But those that he saves 
by grace, become obedient, that walk in the obedience of faith, in the obedience to Christ. One of the beautiful designs of God in setting us free from the world, he's delivered us from the domain of darkness to the kingdom of his beloved son. That is now our kingdom, that is now our king, that is now our master, that is the one that we love obediently. And we've seen so many times in in 1 John chapter 5, as well as in John 15, that obedience is the overflow of love. The love that he has poured into our hearts for him. Um, Moving on uh, down, we see in 1 Peter 1, uh, 17 and following, if you call him father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. That is, that is with a due sense of responsibility, a due sense of worship, and a recognition that, you know, I will stand before him and give an account of that time. And, and, that, and that's the thought. If, I, if you were to, to give an account of that time for last week, for this next week, uh, I do love, in the mercies of God, I, I love and many of us part- uh, follow Robert Murray McShane's reading, Bible reading program. He, he's one who is oft noted as saying one of those things that characterized his ministry is he was committed to always try to preach as a dying man to dying men. And in the peculiar providence of God, God took him at 29 years old. And so that reality, he did not waste an opportunity. You don't want to waste opportunities with your neighbors. You don't want to waste opportunities with with your fellow believers to provoke them to love and good works, to encourage them, to sharpen them as iron sharpens iron, uh, 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 to know their struggles that you might pray for them. What are we doing otherwise? Uh, Our time is much running out. Again, it it carries on, abstain from the passions of the flesh that wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct honorable. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. And so on. Again, the things that I've laid out here are honestly not particularly insightful. They're remarkably plain and remarkably clear in Scripture. So I would encourage you in, in, in light of these passages to read them pray concerning them, discuss them, and then it's, it's wise for us at times to then take stock. We don't want to be uh, have an, a, a, a healthy indulgence of contra- constant introspection, but there is value to examining yourselves and taking stock of your life and, and, and seeing. I sometimes think of the way that interviews are often conducted these days in the world in which we live and thinking... Uh, if we genuinely ask the question the way it's often put in interviews, where do you see yourself in five years? How many, how many of us are thinking, well, um, I, I hope to start out here and then here, and, 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 and we're thinking about job advancement, we're thinking about financial progress, we're thinking about... Um, um, the educational opportunities for our children. We're, th- we're thinking about all kinds of things, but I would hope that when I would ask you, or you might think to yourself, where would I see myself in five years? Our first thoughts would be, where do I hope to be spiritually? What do I hope that God might have been pleased to accomplish in me and how I would hope he would be using me in, in these next five years? Because what's interesting is people do set out plans to how to maximize. I've got a five-year plan. I've got a 10-year plan. You ever heard anyone say that? Yes. Uh, I'm not asking you again to, to say merely, what is your plan? I'm saying we all understand what is his plan for us as those who are in Christ As those who belong to him, what are we to value? What are we to shun? What are we to to pursue? How are we to live? He gives us that plan. And I get it. We may all run at different speeds. 
and growth may be at different progress, at different places. But each one of us individually, it ought to to some degree in our heart be run in such a way as to win the race. Now, I know the temptation would be, look, I don't know, that guy's so fast. There's no point. That guy is so fast. And I remember a number of years ago, and I guess I'll close with this one. I remember a, a number of years ago where there was a, a, a sprint. And I won't name particular names. Uh, and as this race was set, it was a given that a particular ru- runner was going to win the 100 meters. It was just a given. On your mark, get set, false start. All right, let's line them back up. Your mark, get uh, set. False start. The rule of the meet was, if there is a second false start, whoever false started was disqualified. The guaranteed winner did not get to run the race. So, just an interesting notion for all the guys who maybe didn't train to maximum level and hadn't, whatever it was, you don't know. The whole point is you just do your best all right let, let's pray and then uh, again i urge you to to read through these that's why i put these together and you can see that most of what it is is the word of god read it prayerfully read it conversationally read it contemplatively read it committedly all right let me pray and then we'll take some uh, uh prayer requests lord I know for my own self, it is always such a helpful reminder when I see these passages. It just seems that the nature of life in this world and uh, the things that we're exposed to around us uh, promote some degrees of of worldliness, um, value the things that ultimately are vanity, and, uh, and there are still the passions of the flesh which wage war against us desiring to some degree uh, the fleeting pleasures. I pray once again as we've considered these things tonight that you would grant us to see with spiritual hearts and eyes a greater value and a greater treasure that is Christ. Loss, sacrifice, mistreatment, suffering, struggling for Christ is of far greater value than, a, than anything else. Lord, I pray that that we would recognize that the time that we have here is time you've allotted to us. The place that we are here is the place that you have placed us. Oh God, may we be faithful stewards of the time of exile that's been given to us. Lord, we pray that you would stir us up afresh, even in these days of of, uh, so much uh, confusion and uncertainty around us. Lord, I pray that we would not be slothful in zeal but that you would stir us up in our hearts by your spirit to love and good works and that we would seek to provoke and promote those things in one another. God, we pray that you would um, engage us uh, by your word and spirit and that you would move us uh, to engage the household of God and our neighbors at large. Oh God, use us for your name, for your kingdom, for your glory, because it is to that kingdom that you have moved us to that kingdom that we belong that our ultimate allegiance is for we thank you for christ who was given for us and in jesus name we pray these things amen